King Pest Written by Edgar Allan Poe The gods do bear and well allow in kings, the things which they abhor in rascal roots. Buckhurst's Tragedy of Ferrix and Porrex About twelve o'clock, one night in the month of October, and during the chivalrous reign of the third Edward, two seamen belonging to the crew of the Free and Easy, a trading schooner plying between Sluys and the Thames, and then at anchor in that river, were much astonished to find themselves seated in the tap room of an alehouse in the parish of St Andrews, London, which alehouse bore for sign the portraiture of a jolly tar. The room, although ill-contrived, smoke-blackened, low-pitched, and in every other respect agreeing with the general character of such places at the period, was, nevertheless, in the opinion of the grotesque groups scattered here and there within it, sufficiently well adapted to its purpose. Of these groups are two seamen formed, I think, the most interesting, if not the most conspicuous. The one who appeared to be the elder, and whom his companion addressed by the characteristic appellation of legs, was at the same time much the taller of the two. He might have measured six feet and a half, and an habitual stoop in the shoulders seemed to have been the necessary consequence of an altitude so enormous. Superfluities in height were, however, more than accounted for by deficiencies in other respects. He was exceedingly thin, and might, as his associates asserted, have answered, when drunk, for a pennant at the masthead, or, when sober, have served for a jib-boom. But these jests, and others of a similar nature, had evidently produced, at no time, any effect upon the cashnetry muscles of the tar. With high cheekbones, a large hawk nose, retreating chin, fallen under jaw, and huge protruding white eyes, the expression of his countenance, although tinged with a species of dogged indifference to matters and things in general, was not the less utterly solemn and serious beyond all attempts at imitation or description. The younger seaman was, in all outward appearance, the converse of his companion. His stature could not have exceeded four feet. A pair of stumpy bow legs supported his squat, unwieldy figure, while his unusually short and thick arms, with no ordinary fists at their extremities, swung off dangling from his sides like the fins of a sea turtle. Small eyes, of no particular color, twinkled far back in his head. His nose remained buried in the mass of flesh which enveloped his round, full, and purple face, and his thick upper lip rested upon the still thicker one beneath with an air of complacent self-satisfaction, much heightened by the owner's habit of licking them at intervals. He evidently regarded his tall shipmate with a feeling half wondrous, half quizzical, and stared up occasionally in his face as the red setting sun stares up at the crags of Ben Nevis. Various and eventful, however, had been the peregrinations of the worthy couple in and about the different tap houses of the neighborhood during the earlier hours of the night. Funds even the most ample, are not always everlasting. And it was with empty pockets our friends had ventured upon the present hostelry. At the precise period, then, when this history properly commences, Legs, and his fellow Hugh Tarpaulin, sat, each with both elbows resting upon the large oaken table in the middle of the floor, and with a hand upon either cheek. They were eyeing, from behind a huge flagon of unpaid for humming stuff, the portentous words, no chalk, which to their indignation and astonishment were scored over the doorway by means of that very mineral whose presence they purported to deny. Not that the gift of deciphering written characters, a gift among the commonalty of that day considered little less cabalistical than the art of inditing, could, in strict justice, have been laid to the charge of either disciple of the sea, but there was, to say the truth, a certain twist in the formation of the letters, an indescribable lee lurch about the whole, which foreboded, in the opinion of both seamen, a long run of dirty weather, and determined them at once, in the allegorical words of Legs himself, to pump ship, clue up all sail, and scud before the wind. Having accordingly disposed of what remained of the ale, and looped up the points of their short doublets, they finally made a bolt for the street. Although Tarpaulin rolled twice into the fireplace, mistaking it for the door, yet their escape was at length happily effected, and half after twelve o'clock found our heroes ripe for mischief, and running for life down a dark alley in the direction of St. Andrew's Stair, hotly pursued by the landlady of the Jolly Tar. At the epoch of this eventful tale, and periodically, for many years before and after, all England, but more especially the metropolis, resounded with the fearful cry of plague. The city was in a great measure depopulated, and in those horrible regions, in the vicinity of the Thames, where amid the dark, narrow, and filthy lanes and alleys, the demon of disease was supposed to have had his nativity, or, terror, and superstition were alone to be found stalking abroad. By authority of the king such districts were placed under ban, and all persons forbidden, under pain of death, to intrude upon their dismal solitude.
Yet neither the mandate of the monarch, nor the huge barriers erected at the entrances of the streets, nor the prospect of that loathsome death which, with almost absolute certainty, overwhelmed the wretch whom no peril could deter from the adventure, prevented the unfurnished and untenanted dwellings from being stripped, by the hand of knightly rapine, of every article, such as iron, brass, or lead work, which could in any manner be turned to a profitable account. Above all, it was usually found, upon the annual winter opening of the barriers, that locks, bolts, and secret cellars, had proved but slender protection to those rich stores of wines and liquors which, in consideration of the risk and trouble of removal, many of the numerous dealers having shops in the neighborhood had consented to trust, during the period of exile, to so insufficient a security. But there were very few of the terror-stricken people who attributed these doings to the agency of human hands. Pest spirits, plague goblins, and fever demons, were the popular imps of mischief, and tales so blood-chilling were hourly told, that the whole mass of forbidden buildings was, at length, enveloped in terror as in a shroud, and the plunderer himself was often scared away by the horrors his own depredations had created, leaving the entire vast circuit of prohibited district to gloom, silence, pestilence, and death. It was by one of the terrific barriers already mentioned, and which indicated the region beyond to be under the pest ban, that, in scrambling down an alley, legs and the worthy Hugh Tarpaulin found their progress suddenly impeded. To return was out of the question, and no time was to be lost, as their pursuers were close upon their heels. With thoroughbred seamen to clamber up the roughly fashioned plank work was a trifle, and, maddened with the twofold excitement of exercise and liquor, they leaped unhesitatingly down within the enclosure, and holding on their drunken course with shouts and yellings, were soon bewildered in its noisome and intricate recesses. Had they not, indeed, been intoxicated beyond moral sense, their reeling footsteps must have been palsied by the horrors of their situation. The air was cold and misty. The paving stones, loosened from their beds, lay in wild disorder amid the tall, rank grass, which sprang up around the feet and ankles. Fallen houses choked up the streets. The most fetid and poisonous smells everywhere prevailed. And by the aid of that ghastly light which, even at midnight, never fails to emanate from a vapory and pestilential atmosphere, might be discerned lying in the by-paths, and alleys or rotting in the windowless habitations, the carcass of many a nocturnal plunderer arrested by the hand of the plague in the very perpetration of his robbery. But it lay not in the power of images, or sensations, or impediments such as these, to stay the course of men who, naturally brave, and at that time especially, brimful of courage and of humming stuff, would have reeled, as straight as their condition might have permitted, undauntedly into the very jaws of death. Onward! Still onward stalked the grim legs, making the desolate solemnity echo and re-echo with yells like the terrific war-whoop of the Indian. And onward, still onward rolled the dumpy tarpaulin, hanging on to the doublet of his more active companion, and far surpassing the latter's most strenuous exertions in the way of vocal music, by bull roarings in basso, from the profundity of his stentorian lungs. They had now evidently reached the stronghold of the pestilence. Their way at every step or plunge grew more noisome and more horrible. The paths more narrow and more intricate. Huge stones and beams falling momently from the decaying roofs above them, gave evidence, by the sullen and heavy descent, of the vast height of the surrounding houses, and while actual exertion became necessary to force a passage through frequent heaps of rubbish, it was by no means seldom that the hand fell upon a skeleton or rested upon a more fleshy corpse. Suddenly, as the seamen stumbled against the entrance of a tall and ghastly-looking building, a yell more than usually shrill from the throat of the excited legs, was replied to from within, in a rapid succession of wild, laughter-like, and fiendish shrieks. Nothing daunted at sounds which, of such a nature, at such a time, and in such a place, might have curdled the very blood in hearts less irrevocably on fire, the drunken couple rushed headlong against the door, burst it open, and staggered into the midst of things with a volley of curses. The room within which they found themselves proved to be the shop of an undertaker, but an open trapdoor, in a corner of the floor near the entrance, looked down upon a long range of wine cellars, whose depths the occasional sound of bursting bottles proclaimed to be well stored with their appropriate contents. In the middle of the room stood a table, in the center of which again arose a huge tub of what appeared to be punch. Bottles of various wines and cordials, together with jugs, pitchers, and flagons of every shape and quality, were scattered profusely upon the board. Around it, upon coffin trestles, was seated a company of six. This company I will endeavor to delineate one by one. Fronting the entrance, and elevated a little above his companions, sat a personage who appeared to be the president of the table. His stature was gaunt and tall, and Legs was confounded to behold in him a figure more emaciated than himself. His face was as yellow as saffron, but no feature excepting one alone, was sufficiently marked to merit a particular description. 
This one consisted in a forehead so unusually and hideously lofty, as to have the appearance of a bonnet or crown of flesh superadded upon the natural head. His mouth was puckered and dimpled into an expression of ghastly affability, and his eyes, as indeed the eyes of all at table, were glazed over with the fumes of intoxication. This gentleman was clothed from head to foot in a richly embroidered black silk velvet pall, wrapped negligently around his form after the fashion of a Spanish cloak. His head was stuck full of sable hearse plumes, which he nodded to and fro with a jaunty and knowing air, and, in his right hand, he held a huge human thigh bone, with which he appeared to have been just knocking down some member of the company for a song. Opposite him, and with her back to the door, was a lady of no whit the less extraordinary character. Although quite as tall as the person just described, she had no right to complain of his unnatural emaciation. She was evidently in the last stage of a dropsy, and her figure resembled nearly that of the huge puncheon of October beer which stood, with the head driven in, close by her side, in a corner of the chamber. Her face was exceedingly round, red, and full, and the same peculiarity, or rather want of peculiarity, attached itself to her countenance, which I before mentioned in the case of the president. That is to say, only one feature of her face was sufficiently distinguished to need a separate characterization. Indeed, the acute tarpaulin immediately observed that the same remark might have applied to each individual person of the party, every one of whom seemed to possess a monopoly of some particular portion of physiognomy. With the lady in question this portion proved to be the mouth. Commencing at the right ear, it swept with a terrific chasm to the left. The short pendants which she wore in either oracle continually bobbing into the aperture. She made, however, every exertion to keep her mouth closed and look dignified, in a dress consisting of a newly starched and iron shroud coming up close under her chin, with a crimpled ruffle of cambric muslin. At her right hand sat a diminutive young lady whom she appeared to patronize. This delicate little creature, in the trembling of her wasted fingers, in the livid hue of her lips, and in the slight hectic spot which tinged her otherwise leaden complexion, gave evident indications of a galloping consumption. An air of gave extreme autun, however, pervaded her whole appearance, she wore in a graceful and degagé manner, a large and beautiful winding sheet of the finest India lawn, her hair hung in ringlets over her neck, a soft smile played about her mouth, but her nose, extremely long, thin, sinuous, flexible and pimpled, hung down far below her underlip, and in spite of the delicate manner in which she now and then moved it to one side or the other with her tongue, gave to her countenance a somewhat equivocal expression. Over against her, and upon the left of the dropsical lady, was seated a little puffy, wheezing, and gouty old man, whose cheeks reposed upon the shoulders of their owner, like two huge bladders of Oporto wine. With his arms folded, and with one bandaged leg deposited upon the table, he seemed to think himself entitled to some consideration. He evidently prided himself much upon every inch of his personal appearance, but took more especial delight in calling attention to his gaudy-coloured surtout. This, to say the truth, must have cost him no little money, and was made to fit him exceedingly well. Being fashioned from one of the curiously embroidered silken covers appertaining to those glorious escutcheons which, in England and elsewhere, are customarily hung up, in some conspicuous place, upon the dwellings of departed aristocracy. Next to him, and at the right hand of the president, was a gentleman in long white hose and cotton drawers. His frame shook, in a ridiculous manner, with a fit of what Tarpaulin called the horrors. His jaws, which had been newly shaved, were tightly tied up by a bandage of muslin, and his arms being fastened in a similar way at the wrists, prevented him from helping himself too freely to the liquors upon the table, a precaution rendered necessary, in the opinion of legs, by the peculiarly sottish and wine-bibbing cast of his visage. A pair of prodigious ears, nevertheless, which it was no doubt found impossible to confine, towered away into the atmosphere of the apartment, and were occasionally pricked up in a spasm, at the sound of the drawing of a cork. Fronting him, sixthly and lastly, was situated a singularly stiff-looking personage, who, being afflicted with paralysis, must, to speak seriously, have felt very ill at ease in his unaccommodating habiliments. He was habited, somewhat uniquely, in a new and handsome mahogany coffin. Its top or headpiece pressed upon the skull of the wearer, and extended over it in the fashion of a hood, giving to the entire face an air of indescribable interest. Armholes had been cut in the sides, for the sake not more of elegance than of convenience, but the dress, nevertheless, prevented its proprietor from sitting as erect as his associates, and as he lay reclining against his trestle, at an angle of forty-five degrees, a pair of huge goggle eyes rolled up their awful whites towards the ceiling in absolute amazement at their own enormity. Before each of the party lay a portion of a skull, which was used as a drinking cup. Overhead was suspended a human skeleton, by means of a rope tied round one of the legs and fastened to a ring in the ceiling. 
the other limb, confined by no such fetter, stuck off from the body at right angles, causing the whole loose and rattling frame to dangle and twirl about at the caprice of every occasional puff of wind which found its way into the apartment. In the cranium of this hideous thing lay quantity of ignited charcoal, which threw a fitful but vivid light over the entire scene, while coffins, and other wares appertaining to the shop of an undertaker, were piled high up around the room, and against the windows, preventing any ray from escaping into the street. At sight of this extraordinary assembly, and of their still more extraordinary paraphernalia, our two seamen did not conduct themselves with that degree of decorum which might have been expected. Legs, leaning against the wall near which he happened to be standing, dropped his lower jaw still lower than usual, and spread open his eyes to their fullest extent. While Hugh Tarpaulin, stooping down so as to bring his nose upon a level with the table, and spreading out a palm upon either knee, burst into a long, loud, and obstreperous roar of very ill-timed and immoderate laughter. Without, however, taking offence at behaviour so excessively rude, the tall president smiled very graciously upon the intruders, nodded to them in a dignified manner with his head of sable plumes, and, arising, took each by an arm, and led him to a seat which some others of the company had placed in the meantime for his accommodation. Legs to all this offered not the slightest resistance, but sat down as he was directed, while the gallant Hugh, removing his coffin trestle from its station near the head of the table, to the vicinity of the little consumptive lady in the winding sheet, plumped down by her side in high glee, and pouring out a skull of red wine, quaffed it to their better acquaintance. But at this presumption the stiff gentleman in the coffin seemed exceedingly nettled, and serious consequences might have ensued, had not the president, rapping upon the table with his truncheon, diverted the attention of all present to the following speech. It becomes our duty upon the present happy occasion. Avast there. Interrupted legs, looking very serious. Avast there a bit, I say, and tell us who the devil ye all are, and what business ye have here, rigged off like the foul fiends and swilling the snug blue ruin stowed away for the winter by my honest shipmate, Will Wimble the Undertaker. At this unpardonable piece of ill-breeding, all the original company half started to their feet, and uttered the same rapid succession of wild fiendish shrieks which had before caught the attention of the seamen. The president, however, was the first to recover his composure, and at length, turning to legs with great dignity, recommenced. Most willingly will we gratify any reasonable curiosity on the part of guests so illustrious, unbidden though they be. Know then that in these dominions I am monarch, and here rule with undivided empire under the title of King Pest the First. This apartment, which you no doubt profanely suppose to be the shop of Will Wimble the Undertaker, a man whom we know not, and whose plebeian appellation has never before this night thwarted our royal ears. This apartment, I say, is the dais chamber of our palace, devoted to the councils of our kingdom, and to other sacred and lofty purposes. The noble lady who sits opposite is Queen Pest, our serene consort. The other exalted personages whom you behold are all of our family, and wear the insignia of the blood royal under the respective titles of His Grace the Archduke Pestiferous, His Grace the Duke Pestilential, His Grace the Duke Tempest, and Her Serene Highness the Archduchess Annabest. As regards, continued he, your demand of the business upon which we sit here in council, we might be pardoned for replying that it concerns, and concerns alone, our own private and regal interest, and is in no manner important to any other than ourself. But in consideration of those rights to which as guests and strangers you may feel yourselves entitled, we will furthermore explain that we are here this night, prepared by deep research and accurate investigation, to examine, analyze, and thoroughly determine the indefinable spirit, the incomprehensible qualities and nature, of those inestimable treasures of the palate, the wines, ales, and liqueurs of this goodly metropolis. By so doing, to advance not more our own designs than the true welfare of that unearthly sovereign whose reign is over us all, whose dominions are unlimited, and whose name is Death. Whose name is Davy Jones? ejaculated Tarpaulin, helping the lady by his side to a skull of liqueur, and pouring out a second for himself. Profane varlet, said the president, now turning his attention to the worthy Hugh. Profane and execrable wretch. We have said, that in consideration of those rights which, even in thy filthy person, we feel no inclination to violate, we have condescended to make reply to thy rude and unseasonable inquiries. We nevertheless, for your unhallowed intrusion upon our counsels, believe it our duty to mulct thee and thy companion in each a gallon of black strap. 
having imbibed which to the prosperity of our kingdom, at a single draught, and upon your bended knees, ye shall be forthwith free either to proceed upon your way, or remain and be admitted to the privileges of our table, according to your respective and individual pleasures. It would be a matter of utter impossibility replied Legs, whom the assumptions and dignity of King Pest I had evidently inspired some feelings of respect, and who arose and steadied himself by the table as he spoke. It would, please your majesty, be a matter of utter impossibility to stow away in my hold even one fourth part of that same liquor which your majesty has just mentioned, to say nothing of the stuffs placed on board in the forenoon by way of ballast, and not to mention the various ales and liqueurs shipped this evening at different seaports, I have. At present, a full cargo of humming stuff taken in and duly paid for at the sign of the Jolly Tar. You will, therefore, please your majesty, be so good as to take the will for the deed. For by no manner of means either can I or will I swallow another drop. Least of all a drop of that villainous spilled water that answers to the hail of black strap. Belay that! Interrupted Tarpaulin, astonished not more at the length of his companion's speech than at the nature of his refusal. Belay that, you lubber! And I say, legs, none of your palaver. My hull is still light, although I confess you yourself seem to be a little top-heavy, and as for the matter of your share of the cargo, why rather than raise a squall I would find stowage room for it myself, but... This proceeding, interposed the President, is by no means in accordance with the terms of the mulctor sentence, which is in its nature median, and not to be altered or recalled. The conditions we have imposed must be fulfilled to the letter, and that without a moment's hesitation. In failure of which fulfilment we decree that you do here be tied neck and heels together, and duly drowned as rebels in yon hog's head of October beer. A sentence. A sentence. A righteous and just sentence. A glorious decree. A most worthy and upright, and holy condemnation. Shouted the Pest family altogether. The king elevated his forehead into innumerable wrinkles, the gouty little old man puffed like a pair of bellows, the lady of the winding sheet waved her nose to and fro, the gentleman in the cotton drawers pricked up his ears, she of the shroud gasped like a dying fish, and he of the coffin looked stiff and rolled up his eyes. Tarpaulin chuckled, without heeding the general excitation. I was saying, said he, I was saying when Mr. King Pest poked in his marlin spike, that as for the matter of two or three gallons more or less of blackstrap, it was a trifle to a tight sea boat like myself not overstowed. But when it comes to drinking the health of the devil, and going down upon my marrow bones to his ill-favoured majesty there, whom I know, as well as I know myself to be a sinner, to be nobody in the whole world, but Tim Herleagerly the stage player. Why? It's quite another guess sort of a thing, and utterly and altogether past my comprehension. He was not allowed to finish this speech in tranquility. At the name Tim Hurley-Gurley the whole assembly leaped from their name seats. Treason. Shouted His Majesty King Pest the First. Treason. Said the little man with the gout. Treason. Screamed the Archduchess Anna Pest. Treason. Muttered the gentleman with his jaws tied up. Treason. Growled he of the coffin. Treason. Treason, shrieked Her Majesty of the Mouth, and, seizing by the hinder part of his breeches the unfortunate tarpaulin, who had just commenced pouring out for himself a skull of liqueur, she lifted him high into the air, and let him fall without ceremony into the huge open puncheon of his beloved ale. Bobbing up and down, for a few seconds, like an apple in a bowl of toddy, he, at length, finally disappeared amid the whirlpool of foam which, in the already effervescent liquor, his struggles easily succeeded in creating. Not tamely, however, did the tall seaman behold the discomfiture of his companion. Jostling King Pest through the open trap, the valiant legs slammed the door down upon him with an oath, and strode towards the centre of the room. Here tearing down the skeleton which swung over the table, he laid it about him with so much energy and goodwill, that, as the last glimpses of light died away within the apartment, he succeeded in knocking out the brains of the little gentleman with the gout. Rushing then with all his force against the fatal hogshead full of October ale and hue tarpaulin, he rolled it over and over in an instant. Out burst a deluge of liquor so fierce, so impetuous, so overwhelming, that the room was flooded from wall to wall, the loaded table was overturned, the trestles were thrown upon their backs, the tub of punch into the fireplace, and the ladies into hysterics. Piles of death furniture floundered about. Jugs, pitchers, and carboys mingled promiscuously in the melee, and wicker flagons encountered desperately with bottles of junk. The man with the horrors was drowned upon the spot, 
the little stiff gentleman floated off in his coffin, and the victorious legs, seizing by the waist the fat lady in the shroud, rushed out with her into the street, and made a beeline for the free and easy, followed under easy sail by the redoubtable Hugh Tarpaulin, who, having sneezed three or four times, panted and puffed after him with the Archduchess Anna Pest.